So, well, thanks everyone for coming uh, to my presentation titled as Changing the Equipment or Changing uh, the Perspective uh, and dedicated to, to filming and video approach in contemporary documentary and motion picture ethnography. Uh, what, I, what, what I would like to cover uh, with this presentation is these three things. First, I will make a short introduction into traditional motion picture media that is film and video. Second of all, I will talk a little bit more about film and video in ethnographic research. And the third part of my presentation is going to be introducing two different conceptual approaches, that is filmic and video approach. So quite a few things on list, or so let's, let's move to, towards the first part of the presentation. So film versus video, what is what? So film is exactly what you see on the picture. By definition, it's a series of still pictures captured on a photosensitive material. And what is really important for this presentation is that its physical form determine not only how uh, film, as we know it, is being produced and distributed, but also some aesthetical uh, form, some aesthetical quality. Let's have a look at this picture here. I guess this is uh, a still picture from a film that we all have seen. It's Love, actually, made in 2003, so ages, or not ages, but years before a digital cinema spread out. And this is what we understand as film book. Uh, obviously, I could be talking like hours just about a still frame, talking about composition, talking about lights, talking about tones of skin, and so on. Uh, so I give you just one brief example so that you know what, what I mean by that the its physical form determine the aesthetical form. For example, this shallow depth of field effect that is, you know, the actors in front are focused while the rest of the scene is unfocused. It's somehow blurry, right? So this was actually established as a virtue of necessity, as a kind of workaround, because in early cinema the material was not sensitive enough, and therefore the camera operators needed to have the apertures of the lenses wide open. So at the beginning it was really unwanted and unpleasant effect, but at the end of the day it has become one of the most powerful effects of uh, cinematic or film look. So that's about film. Now as for video, this is a completely different story. Uh, Video was invented for uh, EMG work, that is, uh, for TV news, basically. And the reason why it was invented was that they needed to fasten and simplify a shooting workflow, because uh, magnetic tape uh, doesn't require any additional development, unlike film. So this is how, we, how video look used to look like. You can see that there's quite a difference between the picture that we uh, saw previously, right? Now, what happened quite recently is this. Neither videotape nor the film reel are being used for the actual production. Everything was replaced by this device here. And, you know, it's pretty much the same device. And despite of that, you can't say that digital film was equal to digital video. It didn't merge, at least until recently. And now, as a one of the points of this presentation is that there has been a significant technological advancement in motion um, picture technology that led us to, to state that we don't, or we can't really distinguish one from another. This is like a case study. I'm not simplifying that the, that the only aspect of film is resolution, but it's one of the uh, really important aspects. And at the same time, uh, you, you will see why, you know, it, it's like a significant story. So in 2008, uh, when you wanted to shoot 4K video, this was the only option on the market. This is a Red One camera. It cost quite a bit of money, $25,000, and it's just 10 years ago. What's the situation today? It's uh, on the market there are over 60 smartphones, and now great emphasis on the word smartphone, because as you know, smartphones were not invented for whatever, like uh, shooting motion pictures, right? They were invented for communication, for Facebooking, Twittering, Instagramming, you name it. So. There has been a great shift in, uh, in uh, motion capture technology. And that would be my partial point of this presentation. I think uh, soon we will really need to redefine and reconceptualize what we understand as film, because it's becoming unclear, as you can see on the quotation here. So let's move towards, towards the other part of the presentation. Evolution of motion picture ethnography. So uh, to start with film. First film, first ethnographic film is considered to be um, one made by a gentleman here, Felix Hagenol. And by coincidence, it was the year 1895, which is the same year when August uh, and Louis Lumiere organized their legendary screening in Paris, that is considered to be a milestone in the history of cinema, at the beginning of the cinema. So, 
you're not so wrong when you say, well, uh, film and ethnography is being used since the very beginning of cinema. Uh, it's the same with video. As soon as live video camcorders emerged, uh, anthropologists really loved them because they uh, provided many beneficial and, uh, and additional feature that film you know, was not able to compete, really. For example, what the, the anthropologist is doing here, that is reviewing footage in the field, that was not possible with, uh, with the classical film. So both film and video were used in ethnography widely. Now, therefore, there have been many attempts to, to write some theories and histories on uh, evolvement of documentary and ethnographic film. And there, there are two aspects of this evolution. Now, there's a first uh, aspect, this is evolution of ideas. And Harjan actually uh, already point, pointed out in the previous paper that it's like long and complicated story and everyone tried to redefine Reconceptualize to tell you know what is ethnographic film, what is not, and so on. So I'll not go much to the details, but what is interesting is the the other aspect of uh, this evolution, and it is evolution of technology. So this can be Robert Flaherty, you know, um, making his uh, Nanook of the North in twenties with a huge camera that is not really easy to control. Uh, this can be anyone in sixties, light sixty millimeter camera or lighter at least. Uh, Jean Rouge probably, this could be an anthropologist in the 90s, and this can be anyone in 2018 with gimbal, 4K, 8K camera, 360 degree, with a drone on, you know, at the top of their head, you name it. So now, to kind of sum up, there are two kinds of evolution. Something, uh, at the beginning there was a genre that was very posit positivistic, scientific and observational, and at the end, uh, that there was some development to a genre that is more reflexive, participatory, and engaged. And now, at the same time, there was evolution of technology that led us from something, from equipment that was heavy, fragile, expensive, and complicated, into an equipment that was light, durable, cheap, and simple. And now, important part of this presentation. Can we really say that at the beginning of everything, this heavy, fragile, expensive, and complicated thing was film? And which led us to, or imply, positivistic, scientific, observational kind of work. And at the end, we have light, durable, cheap, and simple, miraculous video that led us to reflexive, participatory, and engaged kind of work. What do you think? Is, is it possible to say that? Does anyone have an opinion on that? No. I would argue that no, it's not possible to say that. And I will show you why. I would argue that there indeed has been some evolution, some evolvement. But instead, that it, it led us to, to one perfect form of uh, ethnographic cinema, uh, there is one approach that I call filmic approach, and there's another approach that I call video approach, and anything in between. So how it works? I actually decided to, to show you on, uh, on an example. These are examples of two films. You will see very soon two very short excerpts, about half a minute each. And the reason why I have chosen these two films is um, When God Sleeps and Sonita. Does anyone, uh, has anyone seen any of these films? No, never mind. Uh, they were finished about, at the same, uh, about the same time. They were both very successful in terms of festival admissions as well as festival hours, as you can see. And even the topic is quite similar. So, despite they, they should be really same, I would argue that the approach is completely different. Let's have a look. Scheiße. Bombe. Ich bin noch komisch gemacht, dass ich immer da bin, aber ich habe auch noch gesagt, ich habe auch noch gesagt, dass ich immer da bin. Ich habe auch noch gesagt, dass ich immer da bin. Ich habe auch noch gesagt, dass ich immer da bin. Ich habe auch noch gesagt, dass ich immer da bin. Ich habe auch noch gesagt, dass ich immer da bin. Ich habe auch noch gesagt, dass ich immer da bin. Ich habe auch noch gesagt, dass ich immer da bin. Ich habe auch noch gesagt, dass ich immer da bin. Ich hab
بعد میگه چی؟ بعد میگه همه چی برام بد میشه خوب خاموش میکنی So let's start with, with what we saw So I would argue that the first excerpt was a great example of so-called filmic approach while the other was a great example of so-called video approach Now, based upon what we saw um, in the first excerpt we saw really fast editing with, with variety of shots handheld footage it was handheld footage but do you think that the handheld footage was because you know they ran out of the budget they didn't have money for tripods no i, I would argue that it was for kind of artistic expression to, to create this kind of nervous atmosphere we saw handheld footage in, in the the other excerpts as well but i would argue no it, it was not used as a mean of expression but rather it was used you know that there's no time to to put the tripod on there is it would probably spoil the ethnographic situation um, what is a great and significant difference is, uh, is this point, that in the first excerpt, filmmakers are not per perceptibly involved in the scene. We can't really hear them, we can't really see them. While in the other excerpts, we actually hear the director. She was leading the interview. That's a great difference. And what is really a great difference is, is this point as well, that the first excerpt is most likely completely staged and completely scripted and directed by the director as it is like very common in contemporary documentary. Well, this was purely, purely documentary reality. So I would argue that uh, the first film or a film excerpt that we saw achieved great cinematic quality, while the, the other achieved great ethnographic outcomes. Now, what does it mean in general? Uh, I would start with the, with the aim, because the primary aim of filmic approach is to create a film that is something that you submit for TV, cinema, online distribution platforms, or festivals. Uh, if you need to submit to some, to some of these uh, distribution platforms, you need to achieve certain quality. And therefore, you need to take special care of film look, of what I call film look. That means you need more people on set, you, you need uh, you know, special care of sound, special care of lighting, and so on. And you are probably dependent on, on a greater amount of funding. Uh, once you succeed, though, the the potential of impact is great because uh, if you if you submit your phone to online distribution platform, it is very likely to be seen by many people, hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions. Uh, the video approach is, is a bit different. That the the primary aim is, is ethnographic knowledge. That is, your if you're going to the field, you only care about uh, your ethnography rather than the the outcomes. So you can grab any camera, start shooting, and therefore you don't need any anyone on the set. You are very likely to to really preserve this ethnographic uh, intimacy and so on, and you can do it with very little budget. But at the same time, your impact may be compromised because uh, if it's not, you know, if it, if it's not great enough, it's not gonna be uh, chosen to to distribution. So, uh, another important point of this presentation is is it's not either or approach. That, that I'm saying, dear ethnographers, dear anthropologists, dear documentary filmmakers, from now on you need to decide, are you gonna go for filmic approach or are you gonna go for video approach? No. What I'm suggesting is rather kind of continuum within which uh, every single anthropologist, eth ethnographer, uh, filmmaker can position themselves and choose the, the best strategy that suits to, to the project depending on, on uh, the, the outcomes. What is important for my project? Is it the ethnography? Is it the film? Is it the the impact and so on. Yeah, so, so to say it in, in very few words, uh, that would be my conclusion. As a rule of thumb, you can say that the filmic approach sacrifices certain ethnographic aims to gain the filmic quality, while on the other hand, the video approach sacrifices certain filmic aims in pursuit of ethnographic knowledge. And there is a summary of some key points that I have raised, and that's it. Thank you for your attention. If we have some people here uh, who are active in ethnographic filmmaking of the one or the other kind and have. <laughs> yes, please, and that, yeah, please, please, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not a filmmaker, but I write about film, and um, I think there can be film that combine the two. I find these dichotomies a bit too extreme. In my experience, um, there can be crossovers. 
and um, also what's at stake in these separations that you've made, you know. Um, and what about avant-garde approaches to film that have some ethnographic quality but don't want to be reduced to being called ethnographic. So I work on a Sami film projects, and um, I would say that a lot of times um, is a combination of these approaches. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for it's absolutely relevant, and uh, I'll probably make this uh, this slide very short. But it's indeed I'm not proposing like either or. What I'm proposing is uh, to have a conceptual framework in mind when you go to the field. What I'm trying to achieve. What is my aim basically? Is it the ethnography? Should I not care much about the result of, of my filmmaking? Why can't you care if you want to make an ethnography? Yeah, that, that's the thing. But sometimes you you really um, kind of need to to make a choice basically. You, you need to you need to say, well, in this case, and this this can be not not at the beginning of the project when you when you have a project in mind and you're planning. Okay, I will go for a video project from from the beginning to the end. What I'm rather suggesting is, uh, you are in the middle of shooting days, and all of a sudden you need to you, you are facing like a decision to make. You need to to decide. Okay, should I hire additional sound guy because I'm not able to to achieve. Uh, the sound on my own. It could be and that you don't have the money. So that's it. Yeah. I think economics is a big issue, but it no is. one sets out to make an inferior product. I don't think. <laughs> uh, no. Well, but if there is question to make an inferior ethnography, you know, you know what? I mean. It's always like a matter of uh, choice. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I sort of agree that there is this the way in which you're kind of bifurcating these two approaches. I mean, actually, as you were talking about it, I'm thinking in my mind, like, what is my approach to ethnographic <laughs> films? And I've been making ethnographic films since 2004. And um, I made films that were shown on, and I, I've always shot on video, I've never shot film. I've never touched film, I've never edited film. I've always shot on video. Um, and, you know, I shot films that showed on television, which took a particular cinematic sensibility filmic approach, you know, which were made for television, uh, knowing very well that this is going to show on BBC, so it has to have some kind of quality. And I've made films that were more experimental. You know, one of my earlier films, The Lonesome Woman Made Me Gay, 2007, uh, is a piece that was inspired by Marlon Riggs' film, Tongues and Tides. For those of you who haven't seen this film, it came out in 19. 80s, late 80s, late 90s, shot on video, one of the most, I mean, I saw it, blew my mind open, as an ethnographic, piece of ethnographic film, even though not made by an ethnographer. And so that was a much more personal piece, much more autobiographical and experimental. And I have to say that, you know, while I've kind of worked in both of those approaches, the, the piece that was more uh, personal and autobiographical was one that resonates with people a lot more. So it's not necessary, necessarily that if you take the filmic approach that it's going to resonate with your audience because that is the piece that cultivated more intimacy. You know, so as an ethnographer, my, my goal is to create the sense of intimacy among my, with my, my interlocutors and in some ways taking a so-called filmic approach or taking a full crew of people you know, taking um, your sound person, your mixer, your lighting person, creates a distance which will translate onto the screen, right? So I think that it's, it's for me, the intimacy of that, that, that you can create with a so-called video approach is a much more valuable than any kind of, um, you know, quality that, you, that is gained, to be gained by a, a large, crew of people, and it often resonates with the audiences a lot more. I mean, Lonesome Made Me Gay is a film that has gone on to win several awards and gotten a lot more recognition than any of my other films afterwards, you know? Yeah. And I know inherently that, that it's just, there's a kind of intimacy, but I'm sort of seduced by the beauty of the other ones, too, because it shot on a much nicer, but I shot it for $10,000 as opposed to $2,000, you know? I mean, I spent a lot of money on filmmaking. Um, the, the question that I want to ask is, what are the colonial implications of these different forms of technologies going back to Flaherty, you know, who wasn't exactly only just observing. I mean, he, we know very famously that he orchestrated these shots of the igloo and the hunt, you know, 
So he was very much participating in the production of this very colonialist image to somebody using a drone where we know drones have been used as a kind of, uh, as a technology of surveillance and violence, right? So what are the kind of colonial and the neocolonial implications of these forms of technology? And I think that's a question that, you know, I was wondering if you had thought a little bit about that. Yeah. Even though you've sort of shown a progressivist evolutionary approach, I think it's, the drones are quite scary. I'd, I'd be very hesitant to touch one. Right. to make it for that reason. Right. Yeah, I haven't thought about that much, but I would say that all, um, especially the, the evolution of technology, uh, which I show la, 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 around here, is basically kind of story of democratizing film loop, if you know what I mean. Like, in, back in there, like, no one was really familiar with camera. It was like, you know, very few, very few people. Nowadays, raise your hand who doesn't have a smartphone that shoots at least 2K video. Is there, is there such a person in, in the room? There's one person, you know. So it, there's, a, there's a huge difference. And uh, therefore, this like, uh, technological emancipation, I think, uh, can be also like, used for, for thinking about like, colonizing uh, cinema. Because there's, uh, it, you, you, you definitely know the, the term third cinema. That is cinema made by people who we formally uh, label as interlocutors, and they, they do cinema. Why, why do you, you know, we don't need really anthropologists to come here to, to shoot cinema. We can do it ourselves. We, you know, we can handle the cameras as well as, as you do. So, yeah. But then, but then who, who gets to claim that knowledge, right? Like, who gets to be the director on that film for all the footage that is shown? That's absolutely great that's, question. I mean, yeah. That's a question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have a very lively discussion going on. Uh, I have one uh, for, for sure. And if we want to, if you want to, want to go into like five or ten minutes into your lunch break, I'm fine with me. Then we can continue with two more questions. No, uh, my question is for Chief. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I'm here. Okay. I'm doing very quick, and I'm being very blatant because I um, would like to know um, what your initial. Um, thought was to make such a distinction that was very simply put. Uh, I would like to understand how you came to have this two differentiations. And then the second thing is, um, I'm not sure whether we can today separate in that way uh, that video does not need a group of people because if you watch uh, YouTube videos, Many of them are produced by bloggers, but with a set of people uh, taking care of um, sound uh, and then the editing and so on, very near to a film set. So um, this, this is just a doubt I have with this different thoughts, but first I'd like to know how you came up to think about this. Right, so, so my story basically is about here. So I'm going to do my field work from basically October on. And I was, uh, I was doing kind of methodological preparation and I went through all these, uh, the books that have shown me the um, all sorts of theories upon observational cinema, participatory cinema and so on. And I ended up being around here, to totally lost. What kind of conceptual uh, framework sh should I use for my field work? And then I started thinking uh, from, because what was uh, misleading me was that the, the, the books, the one uh, that are just there, they are suggesting, yeah, there was a development, and the development was driven by both ideological aspects and the technology. And I said, well, so does really technology matter? And then I was start started thinking, what, what today means um, film, let's say? Like, when you watch Game of Thrones on Netflix, is it a film? No, it's not. It was not shot on film. It was not distributed in cinema. But it's part of that. It has like amazing cinematic quality. So what does it mean a film today? And uh, you know, I was uh, claiming to be, you know, I'm going to the field and I'm an ethnographic filmmaker. But what does film mean today? And I was completely lost. So I needed to really make clear what is video? What is film? What, what is like a digital motion picture? And, and what can you really do with it? And uh, sorry, the second question was, uh, yeah, what is the, um, I think it's really hard to distinguish. And uh, like I said, I was uh, kind of deliberately using the term a motion picture throughout the presentation because the, this is kind of neutral term that include both uh, video and film. 
because uh, when you say that YouTubers make video, well, yeah, they, they do, we, we, we call it video, but it's like genre per se, I would say. It's completely different from anything that we know. It's not that, you know, you grab um, video, magnetic tape camera and start shooting. It's, it's shot on digital. It's like you said, it, it can, some of the location of YouTubers can actually look like a phone set. So uh, it's very hard to distinguish. So I'll, I'll be lost to, to, to answer your question. Okay, then we will take one more. Yeah. Okay. 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 Maybe you can all exchange all these interesting questions during lunch break. <laughs> lunch break is from now on until uh, 12.